now at 11. They created a ventilator for a fraction of the cost. A Portland teen is helping fight COVID all around the world. Plus, Metro Health officials say it will be very tough to meet the state's threshold for sending kids back into classrooms. And people duck for cover as 150 gunshots are fired into a Portland apartment complex. That capped off the deadliest month in the city in 30 years. This is KGW News at 11. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Brittany Folkers in for Laurel. Now the numbers have dwindled, but protesters continue in Portland for the start of a 10th week. Right now, one group is in front of the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office in Southeast Portland. This crowd marched from Laurelhurst Park to 47th and Burnside. They can be heard chanting, every city, every town, burn this per precinct to the ground. Police say they've seen some in the crowd throwing objects at officers. At the same time tonight, protesters are again gathered in downtown Portland, and that's where we find our Mike Benner. Mike, what's going on there? Hey there, Brittany. We're at Southwest uh, 4th and Salmon. Uh, I can tell you there are about a couple hundred people out here at this late hour, and we're just a few minutes removed from some very tense moments. Again, here at Southwest 4th and Salmon, I can tell you that uh, there was a standoff between protesters and state uh, police troopers. I'm not sure what led up to the standoff, but I can tell you uh, there was a very tense standoff between the two. We're talking about protesters and state police. I saw state police take at least one person away in handcuffs. Again, not sure why. Um, and then as they uh, retreated, as the state troopers retreated, uh, we know at least one protester threw something at them and they responded with multiple rounds of pepper balls. Uh, and that pretty much dispersed uh, this crowd you see behind me, but there's still a couple hundred people out here. And again, not sure what led up to this whole thing. Uh, we're trying to track that down right now. Uh, but again, the situation out here is pretty tense. And this follows uh, a peaceful uh, demonstration uh, from a group of clergy. Take a look. Show me what theology looks like. Monday evening along Portland's waterfront, a group of no more than two dozen faith leaders rally in support of black lives. But there's more to this group than just that. They're demanding police accountability, denouncing the use of weapons on protesters, and insisting on serious policy change. Reverend Lenny Duncan of Portland Interfaith Clergy Resistance. There is violence out here, but the violence is coming from the, from the uh, Portland Police Bureau. The violence is coming from Ted Wheeler and not from the protesters. Protesters are normal, everyday Americans standing up for the republic. These are moms, these are dads, these are doctors, these are people who are carpenters, and these are a group of pastors who've had to put on body gear in response to first the PPB. Monday night's rally comes just hours after the New York Times published an op-ed piece written by Portland Police Chief Chuck Lavelle. The chief mentioned the peaceful protesters, but also the ones who engage in violence that he says could lead to injury or death. He points to the night of May 29th when protesters broke into Central Precinct and the Justice Center, causing damage and setting fires before looting nearby businesses. Chief Lavelle called the Bureau a progressive agency that's made significant changes to policies and training. He called for an end to violence and pledged to be a leader in police reform. Faith leaders we spoke with aren't buying it. It was outrageous. It was outrageous. At least he acknowledged that some protesters were peaceful, but Truly, this has been over two months, and there has been almost no untoward, let's not even call it violent behavior by protesters. Confrontational, perhaps, but nonviolent. All right, back out here live, you're looking at the intersection of Southwest 4th and Sam. We're just a block uh, away from the federal courthouse and uh, playing out within the last half hour or so. Uh, a tense standoff between protesters and state troopers. We saw state troopers uh, haul at least one person away in handcuffs. And as troopers left, protesters threw things at them and troopers responded uh, with multiple rounds of pepper balls that, uh, you know, put pepper spray in the air, kind of gets in your throat and that dispersed the crowd. Again, not sure what led up to that. We're trying to uh, gather a little bit more information. But Brittany, that is the scene in downtown Portland right now. Let's send it back to you. All right, Mike Benner, thanks for keeping us updated. Well, earlier tonight, around 630, there was a stabbing in Lonesdale Square, one of the parks where protesters have been gathering. Police say the suspect was taking pictures or video when an argument broke out between her and another woman in the park. The suspect stabbed her in the chest. Her injuries don't appear to be life threatening. Police say that they're interviewing the suspect and they say that someone took off with the knife used in the attack before they could take it as evidence. 
On the coronavirus front, we're seeing some mixed news tonight. First, the number of new cases each day in Oregon is trending downward. Just take a look at this chart that shows the daily count of new cases. We've seen fewer and fewer reported cases for the past four days, but it's too early to tell if that trend will continue. On the other side, health officials say more people who are getting tested are testing positive. Last week, 6.1% of tests came back positive. That's the highest rate we've seen since the very beginning of the pandemic. The new number of or the number of new cases went down in the metro area last week, but the number is still well above state guidelines for schools to reopen. For Multnomah County, for example, weekly infections need to be under 81 per week for three weeks for kids to go back to school in person. The county has not met that threshold since the pandemic began in early March. Dr. For Dr. Jennifer Vine says the governor's criteria for opening schools is going to be hard to meet. So I can't say I disagree with it. It is uh, very stringent um, for uh, for a county of our size and a county that's experiencing the level of disease transmission. Um, but again, um, uh, for schools to remain closed for the foreseeable future, uh, I think is a safe move. Uh, and again, allows us time uh, to figure out uh, what's what's going to work and what's not. Many Oregon school districts plan to teach online until early November. And for more on the plans for your school district, we're keeping track of all of it for you on KGW.com. You can text the word school to that number you see right on your screen, 503-226-5088, and we'll send you a link. Well, around the world, 18.2 million people have contracted COVID-19. Almost 700,000 people have died. Many hospitals in developing nations don't have the ventilators they need to treat patients, but that could soon change. Catherine Cook tells us how a Portland teen played a role in a project that could help save lives. Volunteering from home to save lives. Since April, more than 180 doctors, engineers, and innovators, many from Oregon, have been working together remotely. Their goal? To design a low-cost ventilator to treat COVID-19 patients around the world. And they did it. It's called the LifeMech Adapted Ventilator System. On Friday, they received emergency use authorization approval from the Food and Drug Administration. So we're super grateful to everyone on the team who worked with the FDA and all the FDA reviewers for allowing us to bring this product to people who need it. Avi Gupta helped design the ventilator's user interface. At 18 years old, the Portland native is the youngest volunteer on the LifeMech team. He's also the reigning Jeopardy teen tournament champion. From the very beginning, the goal of LifeMech was simple. We all just wanted to save lives. And to do so affordably. Hospital-grade ventilators can cost tens of thousands of dollars. The LifeMech AVS costs around $400 to make. And its design plans are all open source, meaning anyone who has the need and ability to make one can. The original prototype, which is fully functional, was made in our garages. So it's truly something that can be deployed worldwide in an effective manner. I wanted something that I would feel comfortable putting in a patient in an emergency. Cardiologist and LifeMech CEO Dr. Sarab Gupta spoke with us in May when the nonprofit was getting off the ground. They raised nearly $25,000 to fund their effort. Now with FDA approval, they'll partner with organizations to get the ventilators into developing countries like Zambia, Nigeria and Bangladesh. And ultimately that's a benefit to patients and it will save lives because we're getting these devices in the hands of doctors who can use them and people who can need them. The LifeMech team is already working on version two of its adapted ventilator system. Their new goal with a little more time is not just to meet standards, but to exceed them. Catherine Cook, KGW News. A wildfire burning near Hood River is putting some on evacuation notice. The Fur Mountain Fire started Saturday and has grown to more than 200 acres. Three homes have been evacuated and others have been put on notice they might have to leave. It's one of three larger fires currently burning in the state. Peak wildfire season is just beginning and many parts of Oregon are at high risk for fires. Everywhere in red on this map, that's above normal risk. But to this point, the Oregon Department of Forestry has actually seen fewer fires than normal on their protected lands. Yeah, it's an interesting year. Mother Nature has given us a little bit of a break so far in that we've had um, 70, now on lands that Oregon Department of Forestry protects, we've had 73 fewer lightning fires. That's the good news. 
The bad news is that the number of fires that are associated with humans that have been caused by humans, that is actually up by 11%. So to help lower the risk, consider avoiding campfires. Make sure nothing's dragging on your trailer like chains that could cause sparks and don't park your car over dry grass. Well, this is an ugly headline. July was Portland's deadliest month in 30 years when it comes to homicides. And this weekend, the violence continued when someone shot more than 150 rounds into an apartment complex. When asked what police are doing to get a handle on all of this, Portland's police chief said recent reforms are making it tough. Here's Maggie Vespa. It's like a war zone. A war zone that left Kemo Soleimani's northeast Portland apartment complex riddled with bullet holes. It happened late Friday night near 87th and Gleason. Police say someone fired an astonishing 150 plus rounds. One bullet came right into my room, um, missed me barely, you know, on top of the, my head and then landed on the wall. The bullets hit several cars and apartments. There was one reported injury, a woman shot in the arm. We're told she survived. And, uh, I came over and I put a tourniquet on her and, and got her to stop bleeding and kind of tried to help her. You could really smell the gunpowder in the air too. It was really, really intense. Days later, even the police are stunned. And it just shocked the conscience. I've been doing this work for a long time and I specialize in um, gun violence years ago and I have never encountered any crime scene with that amount of gunfire. The shooting itself and the number of rounds fired aren't the only reason officers are rattled. For months now, they've been reporting spikes in shootings, stabbings and other violent crimes, all of it culminating in a jarring headline. 15 homicides in July alone, marking Portland's deadliest month in 30 years. One of the victims, 18-year-old Shay India Harris. She was phenomenal. <laughs> I loved her so much. Last week, detectives named Harris's boyfriend as a suspect, 18-year-old Casey on Colbert. Police are still looking for him. Harris's family thought he was the obvious choice, and they're mad it took weeks for the Bureau to get the word out. That is outrageous. That is beyond where are our officials at? Why is it so quiet? Um, our job, number one for us, is public safety and uh, preservation of life. Last week so at we a news are, conference, uh, Portland uh, Police Chief Chuck Lavelle so didn't mince words. Recent protests targeting racism and police violence have been taxing on the Bureau. Officers are exhausted and stretched thin. Plus, he said calls for reform are coming to fruition. Earlier this year, the city disbanded PPB's gun violence reduction team after a 2018 audit found officers in it were disproportionately targeting black Portlanders during traffic stops. Now, the chief said Portlanders are seeing one impact of that move. What was really lost was the follow-up um, piece um, that assisted in the investigation. Everything from picking up video to going out contacting people and things of that nature. As a result, the Bureau is moving patrol officers to the detective division to try and make progress on a growing mountain of investigations, each one leaving a trail of victims who don't understand what's causing the violence. Because I'm not playing around. I'm not playing and I'm not scared. I'm pissed off. This needs to stop. Maggie Vespa, KGW News.